All right, welcome back. Here comes our last video of the year, uh, at least in terms of new content. Um, this video is going to be pretty long, and it's going to be all about standing waves, and particularly the applications of standing waves when it comes to sound waves. So, first we'll remind ourselves of the couple of types of standing waves that we've seen and talked about already uh, that can be formed. The first type is called open tube resonance and it occurs when we have symmetric boundary conditions which means that the ends are the same in the case of a slinky wave or a spring wave it meant that there were hands at both ends of the standing wave that were holding the ends stationary so there were nodes at the two ends these sorts of standing waves are formed when the length of the slinky or uh, in the case of sound, the tube is half or two halves or three halves or any multiple of a half wavelength. In general, we say the nth harmonic frequency occurs when, well, when the length is a multiple of half of the wavelength. But if we work with what we know about waves here, we can derive a different expression for the nth harmonic frequency. So there we've just replaced lambda with v times t. And now we've replaced t with 1 over frequency. And if we solve for frequency, we get that the nth harmonic frequency for open tube resonance or for standing waves with symmetric boundary conditions is given by n times v over 2l. Before we create any standing sound waves, uh, we're going to try to imagine what goes on when we produce standing sound waves in an open tube. So here goes. First off, the fundamental, which is also called the first harmonic, is produced in this open tube. We'd say it's open because both ends are open. The boundary conditions are symmetric because both ends are open meaning free to oscillate, and in the center there's a node. For these standing waves, we should be able to talk about or imagine the pressure and changes in pressure at any location along the length of the tube, and also the motion of individual particles at any length along the tube. It's important to keep in mind when we're trying to picture a standing sound wave that sound waves are compression waves and that this looks an awful lot like a standing transverse wave. So it's uh, definitely necessary to mention that this is only a way to help us picture it and isn't really what, uh, what's formed inside of a tube would look like. It wouldn't look like anything because typically these tubes have air in them and we can't see pressure differences in air. But um, it is a fact that if a standing wave, the first harmonic uh, standing sound wave is set up in a particular tube, um, that the length of that tube is half of the wavelength of the sound that forms standing sound waves in it. It's also true that this node means that the air particles that exist in the center of the tube don't oscillate at all meaning they don't move to the right or to the left because they're at a node. The air particles on the ends of the tube oscillate most violently. That is, as the standing sound waves are uh, emanating from this tube, the air molecules that are at the ends of the tube will veer furthest to the right or farthest from equilibrium and farthest uh, from equilibrium to the left and oscillate most violently or with largest amplitude among all of the air molecules that are in the tube. It's also true that we should be, we should be able to, uh, and with a little bit of help in the next segment, um, you should be able to imagine what the pressure conditions are like at every uh, location along the length of this standing sound wave. 
uh, for this first harmonic. So to help you with that, there is a link to an animation um, that's really well done uh, that will show you exactly what the pr pressure and velocity of all the particles in this tube are like when standing sound waves have been formed in them. So take a look at that link. Just like we can form standing sound waves uh, with the length being, length of the tube being half of a wavelength, we can also form standing sound waves at um, higher number harmonics uh, with the equation for frequency that was given before. Uh, here's what we might diagram the second harmonic to look like where the wavelength is the same as the length of the tube. And you can see uh, because we've drawn it here, sketched it as if it was transverse, that this is one entire wavelength here. Um, you'll also notice that the second harmonic has two nodes in it, two locations that are completely stationary. Uh, and continuing, we can draw, for example, here the third harmonic, which has, you guessed it, three nodes. Okay, let's see um, and hear open tube resonance in action. First of all, um, I have a scale's worth of what are called boom whackers. These are just hollow plastic tubes. Um, and I'll play uh, on each of them for you first, the first harmonic. So here's the low C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and then this C, unfortunately, got lost, and so I had to replace it with one that does not sound anywhere near as good. Um, this is a piece of pipe from my son's broken plastic hockey net. So, high C. And maybe we'll just play a quick scale. Okay, here it goes. And then a quick scale the other way. That was not so good. Okay, um, what's really great about uh, these things is that, and it should be fairly dramatic even on video here, um, we can experience standing sound waves. So what you saw so far is that standing sound waves or an open tube will exist if the tube is half of a wavelength long. Um, I have here a tuning fork labeled G um, and so it's going to produce sounds of a particular wavelength because of that frequency and because of the speed of sound in my basement. Um, here is, for example, the D tube. And if I hold this tuning fork at the opening after striking it, you probably won't notice much. If I then move it though to the G tube, which is exactly half of a wavelength long for this tuning fork, something noticeable, hopefully, on video will happen. Here goes. Not much. Let's try again with the G. Those are standing sound waves. We end up with amplification of the sound. It ends up much louder than it had been before because that wave energy is able to pile up because of resonance within this length of this plastic tube. Here's another example of open tube resonance with sound uh, or standing sound waves. This is a hollow tube. I'm not sure if you can see all the way through it, but yep, there you are. And uh, because of its length, it will have some frequency at which it can be rotated to produce standing sound waves. Um, also, if I rotate it faster, I can increase the frequency uh, while keeping the length the same, which means that I must be, at that point, hitting harmonics, um, higher harmonics, like a second, third, or so on, of some other um, first harmonic frequency. So, we'll try and get the fundamental first here. Not 
sounds like it's that. And then if I spin it faster, there's a harmonic. Faster. Also, if I shorten it, which I might be able to do, I should be able to produce a different fundamental or a different first harmonic and so on and so on. So I'm trying to shorten it here by squeezing it. And you can hear that that lowest frequency is quite a bit higher than it was before because this length is now shorter than it was before. The last thing worth mentioning here for us for um, open tube resonance with sound is that there are several musical instruments um, whose function is based completely on this, uh, this exact idea of how to produce sound and particularly standing sound waves. Um, for an open tube, those instruments are a flute or a piccolo or other woodwind instruments. Um, your fingers cover the keys or cover the holes and they change the effective length of the tube but the tube is open at both ends, in the case of a flute or a piccolo, etc. Um, you will see the difference uh, coming up with a couple of other types of instruments um, that you could produce at, at your house if you were so inclined. So. Now that you've seen and heard um, situations that will produce open tube resonance with sound, uh, we're going to remember what we can about closed tube resonance, which occurs when there are asymmetric boundary conditions, meaning that the <clears throat> boundaries don't have uh, the same um, situations in terms of the velocity or motion of particles or of pressure or whatever other um, physical properties cause these standing waves to exist in the first place. So, um, we get asymmetric boundary conditions and they produce standing waves when the length of the spring in the case of mechanical standing waves or for us now the length of the tube is one-fourth or three-fourths or five-fourths or any odd quarter number of wavelengths. There are no even harmonics uh, with closed tube resonance. That is, there are no situations where there are, um, th there's no two-fourths or four-fourths or six-fourths standing waves with closed tube resonance. Um, the nth harmonic frequency could be derived similarly as we did before, uh, but we'll cut to the chase here and just say the nth harmonic frequency for closed tube resonance is n times v over four times the length. And this is where n, uh, which is the number of the harmonic frequency, is 1, 3, 5, and any odd number continuing on. Before we see closed tube uh, resonance in action, let's try and picture exactly what's going on for the air molecules inside of the closed tube. We're again going to do this. Uh, for visualization's sake with a transverse wave even though we know that uh, sound waves are compression waves. In this case for the fundamental or the first harmonic we have um, a stationary or uh, a node at the closed end of the tube so this particle this air molecule does not move from this position at all even when the standing sound wave is set up in the tube uh, and then the most violent oscillation occurs at the open end. So here's the close end and the open end and this occurs first when the length of the tube is a quarter of the wavelength of the sound that is being produced. There is no even or there are no even harmonics uh, for closed tube standing sound waves or closed tube resonance. Um, so the next harmonic is called the third um, and the third harmonic occurs when there are here two nodes and the length of the tube is three-quarters of the wavelength. 
And again, we note that at the closed end, the air molecules do not move. And at the open end, they move as far as possible from equilibrium. Finally, I've sketched out the fifth harmonic. And uh, there's not much more to say here. This is, again, the closed end, the open end. Here are three nodes. Um, or three places where the air molecules inside of the tube won't move at all. They don't oscillate at all. They stay at equilibrium the entire time. Now that we've described how we expect closed tube sound waves to be able to be formed, um, we're going to use this apparatus here to make some closed tube sound, uh, standing sound waves. So um, there's water in this container and there's water in this um, graduated cylinder that I think that you can see is right here. The water level is at right now. Uh, if I raise this, they're connected by a tube underneath. And if I raise this, water will flow through that tube down through the bottom and into this container. Right now, the water levels in each of these is at the same height so there's no pressure difference so no water flows um, so when I lift this up it's going to basically shorten the length of this um, closed tube um, what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, standing sound waves to determine in my basement the speed of sound so I have here an A tuning fork that says it's 426.7 hertz. Um, so I know the frequency. And I also know um, that B equals lambda F and that uh, for the first harmonic for closed tube resonance, we get standing sound waves when the length is a quarter of the wavelength. So I'm going to strike the tuning fork. I'm going to hold it over the tube and then raise this water level until we hear standing sound waves. Um, and we're going to mark this graduated cylinder at the depth where that occurs. Here goes. to me like it was loudest right around the 70 and a half mark. I'm going to make sure that that's where it is one more time by lowering it. Hopefully that comes through in the video and you heard it loudest at about the 70.5 mark. All right, so this is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to figure out the speed of sound in my basement. Uh, given that the depth of the tube that will result in standing sound waves is a quarter of the wavelength, and that the speed of the sound waves in this case is their wavelength times their frequency and that the tube depth at the 70.5 mark is 19 centimeters from the top that is that there's a 19 centimeter tall column of air in the tube we can figure out the speed of sound Here is that calculation. According to us, if the tube depth is 19 centimeters, then uh, the speed is going to be the wavelength times the frequency, and the wavelength is four times the length. So the speed can be calculated as four times that length times the frequency, which you were given in the previous video, uh, is what the tuning fork is putting out, 426.7 hertz. With those two numbers put in, we can find the speed in meters per second. 
and it comes out 324.3. If we make proper consideration of our sig figs, though, we would have to admit that um, this is not better than a too significant experiment, and so really we're saying that the speed of sound is somewhere close to 320, but maybe plus or minus 10 meters per second, so it could be as high as 330 meters per second. Also, uh, and this would make for an excellent topic for an internal assessment, there is something called n-pipe correction. Uh, where the proper length of an open or closed tube um, is not exactly equal to the length that the tube behaves as if it is. Meaning, uh, just because we measured the depth to be 19 centimeters does not mean that this closed tube is behaving as if it is 19 centimeters deep. Just like with open tube resonance, there are also many musical instruments that can be made that take advantage of closed tube resonance. Uh, the most well known is probably a clarinet, but um, anything that has uh, a closed end at one end, and that can include your mouth, so like a tuba, for example, um, where you blow on a mouthpiece, uh, is an example of a closed tube instrument. Um, you may have also experienced something like closed tube resonance. Uh, I know I have. Um, if you speak or sing or hum a note while standing on top of a storm drain, often, uh, depending on the depth of the storm drain, you might hear this um, amplification or uh, constructive interference or the standing sound wave um, if you hum the right note based on the depth of the storm drain uh, down to the water, wherever it is. Um, to see an extreme example of someone who has taken this closed tube resonance uh, idea to heart and made their own instrument out of it, you should check the um, YouTube link uh, on your assignment. Watch the, uh, watch the video. Uh, since we're handling all manner of standing waves in this video, um, here's an example of something that you have experienced in a different way, and there are a whole other set of instruments that take advantage of this. This is called slip stick resonance. All I have here is an aluminum rod, and I'm going to hold it at the center, like pretty close to the center, and I'm going to put some rosin on my fingers, just something to help it to stick. Um, and then as my finger slips across it, it sticks to it, um, and based on the speed of sound in the aluminum and the frequency with which my finger uh, starts and stops along this half length of this piece of aluminum, I will set up standing waves with a node at the center on the entire piece of aluminum. Uh, this is again called slip stick resonance. Here goes. Here is a perhaps more famous example of slip stick resonance and one that maybe you've used at a restaurant to irritate people around you. What you do here is you dip your finger in the water and you rub it along the edge or the rim of the glass and standing sound waves are produced because again of slip stick resonance. Here your finger sticks to and then slips off of the glass at the rim and produces standing sound waves. Another possible internal assessment topic could relate to shape, size, volume, height of the air column or the water column or the vessel to the frequency that is produced for standing sound waves. notice as I 
pour water out, but the frequency increases. Uh, as I said before, slipstick resonance is the basis for several other types of instruments, including a violin or a fiddle. The last thing that I think that you should check out is something that um, I had students build at, uh, at IA last year and that uh, previous to that, several years ago at a different school, a colleague of mine built a, a much larger one. Um, this is called a Rubens tube. Uh, he called it a flame tube and um, it shows standing sound waves and shows locations of uh, the nodes or anti-nodes in a closed tube. Um, it's actually closed at both ends, so technically it's a symmetric boundary condition um, situation, so uh, it would obey open tube equations. Um, but regardless, uh, it's called a Rubens tube, and I will try and find some video um, and post a link at the end of your Google Classroom assignment. Um, Basically though, if you watch it closely, what you know is uh, by looking at the flames and the height of the flames on the Rubens tube is you know where the pressure is highest or lowest uh, along the length of the tube. And by varying the pitch or the frequency of the sound that's put into uh, one end of the tube, you can move the locations of the nodes and the locations of high or low pressure.